And I think we are live. Welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. If you are out there in the audience, say hello in the comments section. Today's video is going to be a little um, from the hip. So if you have comments, we will stop and look at comments on a regular basis. On a regular basis. For example, somebody just said, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words right there in the comment section. Good evening to everybody. We are talking about in this video and beyond the fundamentals, there is no grace in Calvinism. There is no grace in Calvinism, and we mean this. And uh, whenever you're dealing with Calvinists, sometimes you have to use very strong and pointed language in order to call their attention to the fact that the one and only reason we reject Calvinism, one and only reason we reject Calvinism, has nothing to do with fairness or free will or any of those things, has to do with the scriptural authority. The only reason we reject Calvinism is because we think the Bible's true. That's the only reason. That's the only reason we need, okay? <clears throat> Good evening, everybody in the chat. People saying hello. Uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, by all means, feel free to support the channel. We could not do this without you, and the details, the uh, information to do so are, are in the description below this video. So since we are dealing with Calvinism, we always attract a new breed of God's special children whenever we do videos on Calvinism. So I need to share with you our disclaimer, Beyond the Fundamentals. This is our, our Calvinistic disclaimer, and I may have to uh, come back to this. <laughs> yeah, the edge of God's ocean is a good starting point for all these discussions. I filmed that on my iPhone in, uh, in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, on a vacation that my wife bought for me. Um, yeah, so that's where that is. So for all the Calvinists joining us, you need to understand where we're coming from. Beyond the Fundamentals does not promote or agree with Arminianism, Pelagianism, Universalism, Synergism, Modernism, or any other ideological label to which Calvinists attempt to map their theological opponents. We also do not hold to free will as an axiomatic premise, nor do we worship ourselves or think that we save ourselves. We completely support biblical predestination, and biblical election, while rejecting Augustinian and Gnostic perversions of these concepts. Okay, so we don't reject uh, predestination. Calvinists will say, "Well, predestination's in the Bible." I know, and we believe it as it appears in the Bible. We reject Augustinian predestination. We reject pagan Gnostic predestination. We think that Pauline predestination is biblical, and we get into that. See our video, predestination. It's nothing like you were told. Now, we have other videos dealing with this. <clears throat> now, Calvinists always like to walk around saying, we, we support the five solas. And the five solas are sola gratia, meaning sol only grace, sola scriptura, only scripture, sola Christus, only Christ, sola, what are the other ones? Uh, fide, only faith, and then solo deo gloria, to God only be the glory. That kind of thing. And you see them. When they sign their little little signature block, they'll have uh, S SDG instead of their name or right after their name, Salo Deo Gloria. It's moralistic. They're moralizing. They're moralizing these things, and they feel like they are more virtuous and moral if they support these five things. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick these five things right here. They believe in sola, the five solas. And they, they have to do with grace, grace, might as well, faith, uh, Christ, scripture, and, and God's glory. Solo Deo Gloria. Only God gets the glory. Those are the five solas. And what we, di what we discuss in this video here, uh, the five solas or the five CNAs, and I'm sorry if you can't see that is that Calvinists actually don't believe in any of these. They don't believe in any one of them. They don't believe only grace. There's no grace in Calvinism. They don't believe that you're regenerated before you have faith. So they don't believe in that. Christ is an afterthought. Your, your salvation is decided by election, not by Christ. Uh, scripture, they run roughshod over Scripture all the time. We have over 300 videos on this channel detailing that, specifying that in, in extreme detail. 
and then to God's, to God's glory, God does not get any glory when you call him a liar, which is essentially what you're doing if you're a Calvinist. You're calling God a liar. I no longer need... <laughs> no, no I'm, so, Ryan, in our comment section, we are not bashing the five solas, all right? What we're saying is that the people who tout them the most don't actually believe them. That's what we're saying, okay? <laughs> Yes, Timothy Hodges, good evening. Like the topic and look forward to time listening on No Grace and Calvinism. Here we go. So I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not bashing these concepts per se, but what I am doing is I'm telling you the people who walk around touting these things as features, by the way, these aren't distinctives of Calvinism. Non-Calvinists believe that distinctives are, of Calvinism are things that only Calvinists believe. These are things that are features of Calvinism, but they are also featured elsewhere outside of Calvinism as well. The Baptists will say the same thing, for example, okay? The non-Calvinist Baptists. Um, I tend to think that when you start using these things like sola grace, sola, you know, only grace, only faith, only Christ, only scripture, only to God be the glory, what happens is those things become moralized and they replace scriptural authority. And what I mean by that is if and the Calvinists do this all the time. If I can prove that my view brings God more glory, then it's more true. Well, hold on. I thought all we had to prove was that this view was more scripturally authoritative. You see how easily that gets off track? It's because you have a moralistic view of these things. And because people view them moralistically, I tend to think that they are a bad... I'm not saying necessarily that they're wrong, but I think they're pretty much a, a bad idea. Uh... <laughs> because of those issues, because of the moralism that creeps into ideological possession. So we have a video on the five solas or the five sines. Calvinists do not have the five solas. They have the five sines. That's the, that's the Latin word for without. The five, not the five onlys, but the five withouts. They don't have grace or faith or Christ or scripture or God's glory in any of their stuff. And we demonstrate that. Now also we were on... Um, we had the Wadester on a couple times, and one of the times we were discussing uh, some things that Jeff Durbin said in a video of his, and in the video that we discussed, Jeff Durbin is up there saying, Grace, we, we in Calvinism have grace that's really grace. Other people don't have grace that's really grace. You know what that is? That's like a, that's like a narcissist telling you that I'm the only one who will ever love you. If you love me, if you leave me, no one else will ever love you. It's, it's toxic. It's toxic to try to use exclusivistic language about these theological buzzwords and try to act like you and your ideology are the only access to these things. And you know what it is? It's gaslighting. If you look at Calvinism, in five seconds, you can see that there is no grace in Calvinism. And they have to gaslight you. And they have to say, this is the place where, this is the only place where grace is really grace. And to make you think like you're crazy, like you don't know what a free gift is. Which is all the word grace means. Grace means the free gift. That's all it is. Undeserved, unearned favor and kindness. Yes, it is absolutely cultish. <clears throat> so we're going to compare, huh, yeah, quintology or something. We're going to compare what Scripture says about grace with what Calvinism says about grace. And this is based on conversations that I've had with Calvinists. As a matter of fact, a conversation with a Calvinist prompted me to write what I'm going to share with you. And I stick it in my notes. <laughs> All right. So let's take a look at this. And, I, and, I think, and I'm hoping that maybe when you're dealing with Calvinists who are all... And here's the, here's the funny thing. You know, in addition to this whole sola, sola, sola thing... They call, they call Calvinism the doctrines of grace. Let me, let me do it this way. Let me copy this slide here. Uh, they call it the doctrines of grace. And what is that? That's toxic gaslighting. There are no doctrines. There, there's no grace in Calvinism. And, the, and the, let's look at what the, doctrine, the, the doctrines of grace are. And they're total depravity. And that is, really, Calvinists don't actually believe in total depravity. 
they believe in singular depravity. They talk about this overarching thing and they quote passages like Genesis 6 where the thoughts and the intents of his heart was only ever evil continually, that kind of thing, you know? Well, what if you talk about practically what people are doing today, there are there are non there are unsaved people, Romans two fourteen, who are doing by nature the things contained in the law, right? And they are uh they're saving babies out of buildings. I watched uh, I watched my wife was watching a documentary on a doctor who turned out to be a pretty bad guy, but he was also a genius in that he was making these um implants that were saving people's lives. Um, there's, in other words, people aren't as bad as they could be. The people who are totally depraved do some pretty good things, right? And there are people who do things like that, who aren't saved or aren't professing Christians and who also aren't murderers and aren't crazy and aren't doing horrible things. You know, they, they live and they die and there's, they're, they're making decisions to buy houses. They're making decisions to get married. They're making decisions to put their kids in private school and make sure their kids have a good education. Um, they're giving to charity. There's people, uh, you know, saving pets and people from floods and burning buildings. There's there's people who are so supposedly totally depraved doing all these good things, right? And what it really boils down to in Calvinism is they don't actually believe in total depravity. They try to do an equivocation word. So where you're talking about absolute depravity. Look up the word total in the thesaurus and see if absolute doesn't pop up as one of the top, you know, synonyms for that thing. It's exactly what it is. Um, absolute. Look up absolute in a thesaurus and see if total doesn't pop up right at the top there. They mean the same thing. There's no difference between total and absolute depravity. What they really mean is singular depravity. They only believe there's one thing you can't do and you cannot respond positively to the gospel. You cannot receive Jesus Christ. That is the one and only thing you cannot do. So they actually do not believe in total depravity. They say it until you get in a conversation with it and you break it down to its practical components, they actually don't believe it. What they really believe is something called singular depravity. But you have to talk with them to get them to see that because they're God's special children. They're not quite all firing on all cylinders. Total depravity, uh, you can't believe the gospel. That's basically all it boils down to. Uh, unconditional election. And what does that mean? That means that uh, from before the foundation of the world, God chose who would and who would not be saved, not based on any condition that they would or would not meet, not based on the condition of faith or works or anything like that, not based on foreknowledge of anything like that. See London Baptist Confession, chapter 3, paragraph 2. God did not decide anything based on any kind of foreknowledge of it, okay? And by the way, as a non-Arminian, we don't believe in in election by foreknowledge either. We believe in election that's in the Bible. Armenian election is a uh, spiced up Calvinist election. That's all it is. So nobody could do anything about it. Some people were randomly chosen way back in eternity past and those people will be saved and nothing can stop that. And also nothing can save the people who weren't chosen. Where's the grace there? And then limited atonement. Only the people who were unconditionally elected get atoned for. Right? Where's the grace there? And then there's irresistible grace. Have you ever heard of a gift? You know what the word grace means? It means a gift. It's a free gift. That's what the word grace means. Um, have you ever heard of a gift that was irresistible? <laughs> what kind of gift is that? It's force. That's irresistible. Force is what that is. There's no grace there. And then there's perseverance of the saints. Now this is not, uh, people think this is eternal security. It is not eternal security. Eternal security in Calvinism actually comes from the doctrine of unconditional election. Those who are chosen are chosen and nothing can undo that. Perseverance of the saints is the belief that if you are truly elect, that you will persevere in faith and good works uh, until you die. That's what that is. It's a no true Scotsman fallacy. If you are genuine, you will X, Y, Z, right? Perseverance of the saints. You will follow our rules, all this kind of stuff. Uh, Frank says, Ephesians 1, 4, corporate election exposes Calvinism. Well, the problem with corporate election is you're still thinking election is salvation. So when you say corporate election, you're thinking you are, you have, uh, Frank, a Calvinist presupposition embedded in your mind thinking that election is still salvation. Election is not. 
Election is about service and blessing. It is not about salvation in Scripture. We have videos on that. We have a video called Election is Nothing Like You Were Told. And we have a video on election word occurrence analysis where we examine every single time a Greek or Hebrew word is translated as elect or chosen or choice or elected or anything like that. Okay? And we find that none of them have to do with salvation. Um, with conversion salvation. Let me clarify that. None of them have to do with the conversion aspect of salvation. They have to do with salvation later, like Second, Second Thessalonians 2.13, that kind of thing. Uh, so perseverance of the saints is just a litmus test. There's nothing really going on there. It's just a belief litmus test that those who are truly elected will persevere in faith and good works. Um, that sort of thing. Not that they won't ever do anything bad. You see, just like just like the total depravity thing, all it really gets down to is one thing. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. It's kind of it's kind of interesting how uh, what is all this stuff? These are not doctrines of grace, by the way. And since since they use the Sovereign Grace Baptist Church, Reformed, right? Doctrines of grace. They're throwing this word around grace. These are the doctrines of anti-grace. There is no grace in Calvinism. There's absolutely no grace in Calvinism. So, as thanks, Frank. Thanks for uh, being interactive there with me. Um, <laughs> good vibes. There we go. I like that. So, the doctrines of grace. There, there is no grace in Calvinism. So when, when a Calvinist says something like, they're not going to use the word Calvinism. You know why? Because they don't want to. They don't want it to be obvious that they're following the wrong JC, John Calvin, instead of Jesus Christ, which is what they're doing. They want to say things like, I'm following the doctrines of grace. There's nobody in the Bible that ever says the phrase, the doctrines of grace. Nobody ever says that. Nobody ever says the doctrine of grace in scripture. Nobody ever says that. There's just grace. And we're going to look at it and see what it says. Uh, sovereign grace. We preach sovereign grace. What do they mean? They're preaching Calvinism. You know, the, so we are reformed theologians. What does that mean? They're Calvinists. That's what that means. They try, they come up with all kinds of different ways to avoid the label of some man that isn't Jesus Christ, which is exactly what they're doing. Now, maybe they should be called Augustinians or Augustinians plus Gottschalt or plus Peter Lombardi, depending on Lombard, depending on which version of limited atonement you want to follow. Even saw a free grace, I saw a free grace write up in Wikipedia that essentially affirmed limited atonement in a roundabout kind of way. We covered that a couple weeks ago. So let's get into this, these comments that I have. There's no grace in Calvinism. In Calvinism, the so-called elect, now that's Augustinian election, not biblical election. The so-called elect were never in danger of anything. Why? Because they were always in Christ. Before the elect were ever born, they were always in Christ. If you look at Ephesians 1, 4, for the foundation of the world? Let's look at that. Let's look at Ephesians 1.4. Let's go to the Bible and let's look at Ephesians 1.4. And let me make this Bible over here a little bit bigger so you can follow along. According as he hath chosen us, now note this phrase right here, in him, in him, is what it says, before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before him. That we should be converted. No, it doesn't say that. It has to do with service and blessing. Okay. Anyway, so they think chosen has to do with salvation rather than what the verse says it's about. And notice that phrase in him. What that means is that they were, they had to have been in Christ before the foundation of the world. Have you ever read, uh, let's see, where is it? Luke 19.10? For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. How on earth did these clowns get lost if they were in him before the foundation of the world? How did Jesus... How, so if they're in Christ before the foundation of the world, how'd they fall out of Christ and need to be found again? How'd Christ lose them? And who's to say he's not going to lose them again? What's going on with that? Now, furthermore... Chosen in him before the foundation of the world? Were you in... Okay, let's, let's keep going in Ephesians and go to chapter 2, verse 11. And he's talking to these... Who's he talking to? He's talking to 
the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. He's talking to what we would call saved, converted people. Okay? Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past, Ephesians 2.11, right after, very next chapter, by the way. By the way, you can cure a lot of Calvinism. You can cure all the Calvinism if you just keep reading your Bible. You may not know this, but Ephesians goes past chapter 2, verse 6. You may not know this, but uh, Romans goes past chapter 9. There's like seven more chapters in the book of Romans. Calvinists don't know these kind of things. All kinds of Bible the Calvinists never run into. The book of John goes past chapter 6. You might be interested in chapter 12 one day when you get a chance and you got nothing else to do. Okay, If you just keep reading, you can clear up a lot of Calvinism. Wherefore, remember that being in times past Gentiles who are... Uh, let me, let me uh, bring this up a little bit since we're not using the notes today. That ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision, by the, which is called the circumcision of the flesh made by the hands, Jews and Gentiles there. That at that time, at that time, you're walking around on this earth unsaved. Ye were without Christ. Does that sound like you're in Christ? No. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and from strangers of covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Does that sound like somebody who's in Christ? It doesn't to me. But look, look at the comparison. But now in Christ Jesus, who ye sometimes were afar off, are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. Something happened with respect to the blood of Christ. Was the blood of Christ shed before the foundation of the world? Not that I know of. All right. You might be thinking of Revelation 13, 8, but then we could discuss about the, whether what the, what that's modifying. But that's... Uh, that's a different issue altogether. I think most people agree that what's being modified there is when the names are written. <clears throat> but now, so anyway, these people went from not being in Christ to being in Christ. So how how are they in Him before the foundation of the world? You see, the Calvinist interpretation of Ephesians one four must be off, or you have a contradiction with these other passages. Not to, not to uh, mention, if you, keep, if you keep going, in Romans chapter 16, which Calvinists don't know is in their Bible, because it's after chapter 9. If you go to Rome, by the way, Romans 9 is one of the most anti-Calvinist chapters in the entire Bible, very easily so, especially if you understand a little context. Remember, context and Calvinism never go together. He says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Now, wouldn't you say Paul's elect? Wouldn't, how did somebody else get in Christ before him? How did that happen? So, that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with, uh, we're not dealing with people who are interpreting the Bible incorrectly. We're dealing with people who either can't or won't read. That's what we're dealing with. That's the level at which Calvinism uh, can be corrected. It is a simple ability or willingness to read. And bam, problem solved. So these people, if you were elect in an Augustinian sense, in like a Gnostic sense, not a biblical sense, they, you were never in danger of it. You never needed to be saved. You may not have known you were saved in the Calvinistic paradigm, but you never needed to be saved because you've always been in Christ before the foundation of the world. And you were chosen as such, chosen under the condition of being in Christ. That very verse Destroy, even if it was interpreted Calvinistically, it still destroys unconditional election because they meet the condition of being in Christ in order to be chosen. I mean, you can't be, <laughs> you couldn't be this remedial if you stayed up all night with a remedial machine. I mean, you had to be some kind of special in order to fall for this nonsense. And, uh, and were chosen as such in accordance with their view, Okay. They were never in danger to need any grace. So if you're the elect in Calvinism, do you need any grace? No, you don't. You're already elect. What else do you need? Your fate, your salvation is already sealed. It's already locked in. You're locked in from before the foundation of the world. What else do you need? Nothing. Well, Jesus needed to come die to pay. Jesus is just filling orders at that point. There's nothing decisive that Jesus does in Calvinism. All the decisiveness took place before the foundation of the world. Jesus is just showing up as a peripheral, as part of the plan, filling orders. All right? He's, he's the contract fulfillment agent. That's all he is. There's, there's no grace that he brings, the grace. So a Calvinist could say, well, election is a grace because that's a gift. You could say that. But what we'll find out next is that the grace that's in the Bible 
and the grace of Calvinism, if you want to make election your grace, that they never match. The, the grace of Calvinism is not the grace of the Bible, is another way you could title this video. Two different things. But there's no grace in Calvinism. So they were chosen before the foundation of the world that, that before they were even born, they were never in a condition to where they needed to be chosen. They were never in a condition where they needed any kind of gift. It was endowed upon them before they were even born. There was never a need, you see? There's no grace. They don't need any grace. They're already born endowed with indelible uh, eternal salvation. They don't need a gift. You can say, well, that was the gift. Well, they're born with it. Who was it given to? You see? It's crazy. Crazy talk. All they needed, all the so-called Gnostic elect needed, was to be made aware of the election of which they were already the recipient. That's all they needed. So, the next phrase here, next paragraph, the so-called non-elect... So those people who haven't been chosen before the foundation of the world, they are never offered any grace in good faith. And a Calvinist will say, well, there's common grace. There's, you know, they got the rain and the fresh air and the trees and the ability to make money and get married and have kids and have love. There's common grace that God gives to everybody before he scorches them in hell for all eternity, boiling and frying in oceans and rivers of liquid fire. They got that common grace there. Isn't that nice? that nice that they get that thanks frank thanks for the super chat i appreciate that he said god bless you and your family brother kevin you are much appreciated and if i get any super chats uh you are guaranteed to have your comment read uh, unless you have some kind of profanity or something on there which i will read that i mean i enjoy that kind of thing but you never know um so when, you're pre when they're preaching the gospel to the non-elect, you know, they'll say, well, we don't know who the elect are. Of course they don't, right? Because the secret things belong to God. Bear that in mind because that's going to come in handy later when we're talking to uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, that kind of thing. So the non-elect are never offered any grace in good faith. Yes, the gospel is preached to them, but if they're not chosen, they can't believe it because they're totally depraved, right? See Acts chapter 10, verse 2 for a great description of what totally depraved looks like. Or with what's called a well-meant offer, okay? So when, so when Calvinists are preaching the gospel to who might be non-elect people, it's not a well-meant author. It's not in good faith. It's really like a, a necromancy spell book that wakes up the elect. Those who are really sheep will hear it and those who aren't won't. So they're not actually delivering a message. They're not actually delivering good news. They're casting a spell that's supposed to awaken the elect. That's really what's happening. It's like a modified version of witchcraft is what's going on. There's no message happening. So the gospel that they hear, the gospel that the non-elect hear was not meant for them and can never apply to them. It has no power to save anyone. It only has power to notify and awaken the elect who have already been securely in Christ from before the foundation of the world. So the elect don't need any grace. And the non-elect don't get any grace. What's that mean? There's no grace in Calvinism. That's what that means. There's no grace in Calvinism. So, you know what John 1.17 says? It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Came, grace, came by Jesus Christ. So if election was your grace, Calvinist, what came by Jesus Christ? He didn't bring election with him. He's filling the order of election. That's all he's doing. He's an errand boy. Your, your, your Christ is an errand boy filling orders for a sadistic God who lies to people and wants to burn them forever after giving them common grace and letting them smell the flowers for an ephemeral moment. You know? So what, what grace and truth came by Jesus Christ in Calvinism? None. If you're a Calvinist, Jesus didn't bring anything. None, because election had already occurred for the elect long before Jesus came. If election is considered grace, then Jesus brought nothing with him, for he brought no election to the elect, 
nor did he bring it to the non-elect. What did Jesus bring with him? Nothing, if Calvinism is true. Nothing. He didn't change anything. He may have filled the order, right, to fill out the, the rest of the processes that have to take place to redeem the elect and pay for them and all that kind of stuff, but he didn't do anything decisive, okay? Let's stop debating hell in the comment section, all right? Let's uh, see if we can pay attention here. Um, yeah, I guess I brought up hell, didn't I? Most of my family members and loved ones are unsaved, so when I first heard of Calvinism, basically told me that they had no chance of being saved, right? No grace for them, right? What came with Jesus from a consistent Calvinist view? Absolutely nothing. Let me say that again. What came with Jesus from a consistently Calvinist view? Absolutely nothing. No grace, no truth came with Jesus. Okay? Why? Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Well, if Calvinism is true, that is not true. So Jesus showed up and lied to everybody. Right? You ever count the number of times in John 6 that everlasting life is tied to belief? How many times you hear a Calvinist talk about that? In Calvinism, Jesus is just an errand boy filling orders on something that had already been determined long before. He's just a periphery of something that is already in motion. He doesn't even have any agency, mission, or capability. In Calvinism. Now, I'm not saying this about the biblical Jesus. I'm saying this about the Calvinist Jesus. Okay? Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I fear, uh, Paul tells these guys, would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, and I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Not ten virgins, in Matthew 25. One virgin. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus who was just an errand boy, who did not bring grace and truth, who has no agency, and who was not decisive, uh, whom ye have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might bear well with him. I believe the, Calvinism, the Jesus of Calvinism is another Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. And you may say, well, you're saying Calvinists are unsaved. I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is that the Jesus of Calvinism is not the Jesus of the Bible. The grace of Calvinism is not the grace of the Bible. That's what I'm saying. Now, how you think that falls out to their eternal destiny, you can decide that for yourself. I've already told you before on this channel, my basis of fellowship with people is not based on whether or not I think they're saved. It's based on whether or not they are trying to do what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to engage with Scripture. I'm trying to interact with Scripture in a way that results in transformation for myself and other people. That's what I'm trying to do. If I find somebody else who's trying to do that, I will do that with them. I'm not going to try to assess whether or not they are saved. So I'm not going to have a, I don't have a comment on that, even though that is very frequently asked. Next thing we have, Titus 2.11. What does Titus 2.11 say? It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. What hath appeared to all men? Pray tell. What hath appeared to all men? Well, when Titus 2.11 says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, what was this referring to in Calvinism? It can't be election because even the Calvinists say that they can't tell who the elect are. Oh, the secret things belong to God. We don't know who the elect are, so we just got to preach to everybody. So what appeared to all men? And what difference did it make? The elect are going to be saved anyway. The non-elect are going to go to hell anyway. So what difference did anything appearing make? And if, you, if election is your grace... You yourself say election is not something you can tell who has it or not. The secret things belong to God. So what appeared? Nothing. Nothing appeared. All right? That's why we say we reject Calvinism because we think the Bible's true. Calvinists don't believe the Bible. I'm not just saying that as an argumentative kind of moralistic thing. What I'm telling you epistemically, they do not believe what that book says. 
And that's why it's a good reason. If you're a Calvinist out there, I invite you right now to leave Calvinism and join the rest of us who are exploring the Bible with the mindset that it's true. All right? So even the Calvinists say they can't tell who the elect are. So if election is your grace, when did it appear? What appeared? Well, how did the grace of God that brings salvation appear to anybody if you're a Calvinist? It did not. Christ didn't bring any salvation. Election brought salvation. Christ just filled an order. And it didn't appear to everybody. It didn't appear to all men. R.C. Sproul, Sproul wasn't even sure if he was one of the elect. I've covered his comments on this channel before, where he had to go back and look at his performance to see whether or not he's one of the elect. So what appeared to them? What appeared to all men? Nothing. Nothing. What came to be apparent to all men? Nothing. Nobody knows who the elect are, but Calvinists insist that election was settled long before Titus 2.11 was ever penned and long before the subject of Titus 2.11 was even thought of. So what appeared to all men as if, if one is a consistent Calvinist? If you're a consistent Calvinist, what appeared to all men in Titus 2.11? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Okay. The, the errand boy showed up. What salvation was brought in Titus 2.11? It wasn't in Calvinism. Election was already determined. No salvation was brought to anyone. No grace appeared to anyone. Perhaps only evanescent grace. You know, that's that Calvinistic belief that God gives enough people to say, Lord, Lord, have we not cast out devils in your name? Matthew 7, 20 to 21 type stuff. Depart from me, ye cursed workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Apparently God is, not only is he going to give them common grace so that they can smell the flowers and feel the rain on their skin and then burn in oil, you know, rivers and oceans of liquid fire for all eternity because he's so nice, but he's also going to give them evanescent grace so that they think they're going to escape all of that, but then go anyway. Isn't that nice of him? Such a nice, nice, loving, evanescent grace God. You know, tricking them out. Tricking, tricking them like that. You know, that old trickster. But nothing of any consequence since election was already determined prior to the substance of that verse coming to pass. So there is no need for Titus 2.11 to exist in your Bible if you are a Calvinist because no grace appeared, nobody brought any salvation, and nothing appeared to all men. No grace came, okay? Now, furthermore, what else happened? In John, in Acts seventeen thirty one, because he hath appointed a day in the which, this is Paul talking to a bunch of lost Greek Athenians, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. How could you give assurance to a bunch of non-elect men? And why would a bunch of elect people need assurance? By the way, you know what the word assurance is right there? It's the Greek word pistis. That's the same word that's translated as faith and belief, 239 times in your Bible. Remember the Calvinist saying faith is a gift and God has to give it? Bam, right there. He hath given assurance, pistis, faith unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Look it up. Go to Blue Letter Bible. Go to Bible Gateway and look that word up and you will see that it is the Greek word pistis, faith given to all men. There you go. Call faith a gift all you want. But who has it been withheld from? Nobody. Nobody. Everybody's got it. So that matches Titus 2.11. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That makes sense. That goes with Titus 2.11 quite nicely. Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all kinds of men. Nope, that's not what he said. All kindred tongue nations and tribes. Nope, that's not what he said. Will draw all elect. Nope, that's not what he said. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. All. Now, the Calvinists are in trouble here of becoming uh, universalists because they think the word draw means some kind of forceful drag thing. You see, they use the, the Lunita Greek lexicon, which does not actually have an entry for Helkuo, but has one for Suro, which is supposed to be in the same semantic range as Elkuo. 
and it is more forceful than draw, but it doesn't really matter because Christ draws all men to them, but uh, he doesn't force anybody to get saved. And he says, no man can come to the Father except the Father, uh, no man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him and I will raise him up the last day. What does that mean if the Father draws them? That means they can come. That word can in John 6, 44, if you were to take that, if you were to take that word out of the verse, it would not change the meaning at all for a Calvinist. Why? Because they don't believe the Bible. The result of God drawing people John 6, is that they can come. Not that they're forced to come, but that they can. No universalism. Here, now, now after the resurrection, if I be lifted up, because the very next verse, John 12, 33, you got to keep reading to get that. I know Calvinists aren't really keen on that skill set, but you just got to keep going one more verse. And he said this signifying what kind of death he should die, is what it says. So this one is going to be crucified. If I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. Okay. So he's going to draw all men to him. And uh, now after the, after, the res- after the crucifixion and resurrection, is the father doing the drawing or is the son doing the drawing? We only have a scriptural indicator that the son is doing the drawing after the resurrection. So it's kind of like Jesus is saying, no man can come to me except the father would sent me to draw him. And then he says, well, now we're going to have a change up here. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to raise again. And now I'm going to be the one drawing people, not just the father or not the father. Right. But, Oh, you know, what's interesting though, (laughs) a W pink's book on the Holy spirit. He says the Holy spirit draws guess, you know, of the three members of the Godhead God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. Guess who's the only one in the new Testament that never does any drawing. God, the Holy spirit. Never does any drawing. The Father draws. Jesus draws. John 12, 32. John 6, 44. Holy Spirit never draws. Never does. So why is there a Calvinist doctrine under A.W. Pink that says the Holy Spirit's got to draw you? Why? Okay. You think Jesus doesn't know the difference between uh, the Father and the Holy Spirit and the book of John? You ever read those three chapters about the Comforter? When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth and I will leave a Comforter with you. You ever read John 14? You ever read John 16? Do you think Jesus doesn't know the difference between the Father and the Holy Spirit? And he just throws these terms around, you know, interchangeably? Crazy. You gotta be, you gotta be, you gotta be crazy to be a Calvinist. I mean, you just gotta be absolutely crazy to be a Calvinist. I mean, psychotic. Like clinically psychotic in order to be a Calvinist. I don't see, I don't see how a sane person could be a Calvinist. And I say this having been one, okay? Now in Scripture... Grace is accessed by faith. In Romans 5, 2, it says, By whom we also have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's the Bible. Where is that grace that's, that's accessed by faith? Where is that in Calvinism? You don't have that in Calvinism. In Calvinism, faith is accessed by grace. In Calvinism, you have this thing called irresistible grace, which irresistibly forces you into faith and gives you faith as a gift after you're regenerated. That's not Bible. There's no Bible for that. In the Bible, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we now stand. So faith is the means by which we receive the gift of grace. So where is this in the Bible? In Calvinism, faith is accessed by grace. They have it backwards. Where is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. Why isn't it in the Bible? Because Calvinists don't believe the Bible. All right? Our only, the only thing that separates us from Calvinism, nothing to do with free will, has nothing to do with fairness, nothing to do with any of that. The only difference between us and Calvinists is that we have simply chosen to believe the Bible. And that separates us from anybody who has chosen not to. And even though they think they do and they say they do and we're sola scriptura, all that nonsense, we have demonstrated even in this very video, they do not believe what that book says. That's not a moralistic claim. That's an ability to read claim. That's what the words say and they don't believe it. Matter of fact, I take this verse here and I swap around faith and grace and I put them backwards and I hand it to a Calvinist and I tell them, Tell me what false thing that thing says, and they cannot tell me. Why? Because they don't believe the Bible. I could tell you in a heartbeat. I could tell you in five seconds. Try that on me. 
try to modify a verse to match what you think my beliefs are and tell me if I can't tell you what's wrong with it. Not just that it's modified scripture, that's what they'll do. Well, we believe the scripture and the scripture says this, but they can't tell you what the, what the modified, why the modified version is wrong. They can't do that. So, in scripture, the abundance of grace is received. We're gonna look at this. Before I read this comment, let's look at the text of Scripture in Romans 5.18. Notice the word received here shows up uh, in Romans 5.11, by whom we have now received the atonement, and received shows up over here with, guess what? Grace shows up with the concept of grace. For by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace. Now what's a Calvinist going to do there? A Calvinist is going to try to say, well, that's a passive receiving and that's the elect receive the abundance because God gives it to God endows them with it. No, 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 no. We're not going to let you get off that easy. Why? Because in the English and in the Greek, if you look at those words, they are both active, verb, aorist, active, indicative, first person, plural. What about this one over here? Lambanantes. <laughs> Lambanantes, all right? Um, lambano. What is it? What's the parsing on this? Verb, active. Present, participle, nominative, masculine, plural. Active, active. What does that mean? That means that the receiver is actively doing the receiving. That's what that means. There's nothing passive here. There's no elect person who's totally depraved and can't receive Christ being forced to receive him with irresistible grace. There's nothing like that happening. The ver the, and I've never had a Calvinist be able to answer this before. I've presented all kinds of Calvinists, seminary trained, uh, boasting of their Greek knowledge Calvinists, which they all do, and presented them with this and they have no answer for it. They just burn out their gears and strip out their clutch plate and they can't handle it, all right? They just begin to openly weep. So um, these words here, lambano, the way it is parsed, it is active. So this, this grace must be received by the receiver actively. So the grace is not some election that happened before the foundation of the world. The grace is something you receive in your lifetime and you have to receive it. You can call that a work all you want, and you can go equivocate all you want. In, in this very same book, Romans chapter 5, he just got through for two chapters telling you that the works are the works of the law, right? And when Calvinists try to make faith and belief a work, it's the opposite of what the Bible's saying. And they will try to pull that trick on you. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Very clear, very clearly distinguished. If you back up to Romans chapter 3, verse 28, look what it says. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And what a Calvinist actually believes is therefore a man is justified by regeneration without faith because we have arguments that make faith a work. And then we twist John 6, 29 and 30 out of context to try to reinforce those arguments, which is uh, some more sophistry going on there. Therefore, Romans 3.20, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So when Paul is talking about works, he's talking about the deeds of the law. He's not saying without faith and without belief. He's not saying without receiving the abundance of grace, without receiving Jesus Christ, John 1.12. He's not saying without that. He's saying without the deeds of the law when he says not by works. Now to him, Romans chapter 4, verse 5, but to him. That worketh not, what's the context? The deeds of the law. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Very clearly, believing is contrasted with works. Calvinists will try to make belief a work. Do not let them do this, okay? They are good at gaslighting you to make you think that you are going crazy when you obviously see two things to be different and they try to tell you they're the same. Faith is a works. Scripture just contrasted the two and used them juxtaposed, countered against each other, as if they are not the same thing. 
Always go with scripture over Calvinism. Always go with scripture over Calvinism. There's another little nugget here in Romans chapter 5, verse 18, that you may not notice, is that the word all shows up twice in the exact same context here. The offense of one, by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Well, Calvinists try to make this really all, all without exception, and they try to make this one all without distinction. Right in the same context they do that, because context and Calvinism never go together. See, context never determines. No, you can't take like John twelve nineteen and John three twenty six and put it in the context of the second time the word all shows up in Romans five eighteen. It doesn't work that way, Calvinists. And by the way, you're taking the words of Pharisees and naysayers over and above Jesus Christ's own words of John three sixteen when you use those arguments. Okay. So the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now notice that, so a Calvinist there, when you, when you believe this, this really means all. They're going to they're gonna try to call you a universalist. Well, the free gift came upon all men justification of life. You're trying to say that all men get saved. That's not what it says. Did you know that the word saved does not appear in that verse? It does not appear. You know what does show up? The free gift. You would say, well, that's in italics. It wasn't in the original Greek. You know why it's there? Because it's being pulled from Romans 5, 16, just two verses earlier, which is in the original Greek. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So when he talks about it over here, the same thing, the offense and the judgment and the offense and the judgment, the free gift, he's pulling it in from Romans chapter 16. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Why isn't that universalism? Because the free gift, what must happen to it? Verse 17, it must be received. Much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. That gift has to be received. Does everybody receive it? No, they do not. Well, Kevin, how come some people hear the gospel and receive it and other ones don't? Acts chapter 17, verse 11 through 12. Go read it when you get a chance. The Bible tells you. It tells you. Acts 16, 14. What was Lydia doing so that God would open her heart? She was already worshiping God. She was already going to a prayer meeting. That's why God opened her heart. What happened with Cornelius? He was devout. He was giving alms. He was praying. And he's even told by the angel that thine alms and prayers are come up as a memorial before God, a lost person. Lost person. So the free gift must be received. The grace. They which receive. That's a subset. They which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So you've got to receive it. You've got to receive that gift. In Calvinism, is there any gift that you can actively receive? No, there is not. There is an election that is forced into you that was determined long before the foundation of the world. There's no grace. The, the grace of the Bible, the grace of Romans 5.17 is not in Calvinism. It's not there. And the grace of Calvinism is a mismatch for the grace of, of Romans 5.17. So you could go back to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. Not only the Jesus whom you never preached, but you could also add in there the grace. I, I fear that you've received a grace which we did not preach. That's exactly what's going on here. And then they gaslight you to try to tell you that they're the only ones that have the grace. We have grace that's really grace. There's no grace in Calvinism. It's obvious. Don't let them narcissistically gaslight you and toxically talk you out of what you're obviously observing. Compare what they believe with what the text says. There is no grace in Calvinism. It's not there. In Scripture, the abundance of grace is received. Romans 5.17 It's received actively by the receiver in their lifetime. But in Calvinism, grace is irresistibly forced. The received, or Romans 5.17, is active. 
It's active voice in the Greek and English, meaning that the receiver does the receiving. There is no place for this in Calvinism. The grace that is found in Scripture is not found anywhere in Calvinism. The grace that is touted in Calvinism is not found anywhere in Scripture. That's what, I, that's what I want to nail home for you. The grace that is found in Scripture is not found anywhere in Calvinism. The grace that is touted in Calvinism is not found anywhere in Scripture. Now, let me know in the comments if y'all want me to make these slides available in, uh, in Etsy. <clears throat> All these slides that we've covered. I can make these slides available on Etsy so that you can purchase them and take them home and put them under your pillow and sleep with them. And uh, roll them up, print them out, roll them up, and beat Calvinists over the head with them. All right. Or you can use them in your church. You can edit them. You can use them in your home Bible study while you're preaching, teaching Sunday school, whatever it is you want to do with them. You can do it. If you want me to put these in Etsy, let me know in, in the comments section, and I will stick them in Etsy uh, so you can get them. But they're not there right now. Now, let's see here. Comments section. Somebody said, smash the like button, folks. Yes, do that. You're killing it tonight, Kevin. All right, the Bible wins every time. All you got to do is believe the Bible, and uh, refuting Calvinism is easy. Uh, grow toward your second self. Um, I think there's some kind of dialogue going on here with some other folks. Uh, this man clearly does not understand Calvinism. Can't you hear this, uh, the erudite voice? He, like so many others, thinks he dies. I think he meant to say does, but he doesn't. Okay, Randy M., what am I missing? What exactly am I missing? I, well, here's what I think is going on. When you say I don't understand Calvinism, that is gaslighting. That is narcissistic, toxic gaslighting. I can read the London Baptist Confession. I can read the Institutes of the Christian Religion. I can read John MacArthur's nonsense. I can read all the stuff. And I can compare it with Scripture. And I can put two and two together. All right? And you may not know this, but there are people in a Fortune 4 company who pay me a good, handsome amount of money all the time to analyze data for them. I think I know how to analyze data. And I know you're thinking 1 Corinthians 2.14, you're a natural man, you're not receiving the things of the Spirit. Aren't you not supposed to tell people that they're not saved? And you know that's the cardinal rule of you know, politically correct you know, sissy Christianity these days? <laughs> uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 is about carnal Christians. It's not about lost people. All right, so tell me, tell me exactly what I don't understand about Calvinism, Mr. Randy M. And I'll, I'll take your word for it. I'll take, I'll take what you describe the Calvinism that I'm missing somehow. Now, when you say that, when you say this man clearly does not understand Calvinism, what you're really doing is you're expressing frustration that I'm not wording it as palatably and as wordsmithy and as moral framing like you would like to have it worded. You want to be the one to present Calvinism in a nice, kind way that manipulates people into thinking that they have to believe it or they're going to be guilty of following Bethel or Semipelagianism. Well, we're not going to do that here. So you can go manipulate some people somewhere else. But tell me. Yeah, of course, only, only the elect understand it. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's uh, exactly what he's saying that's wrong. The spiritual blessings in Ephesians 1-3 are rewards at the judgment seat of Christ, somebody says. Please explain, Randy M. Calvinists always respond with, oh, you just don't understand Calvinism. Uh, my Calvinist pastor told me the doctrine of election is for assurance a few weeks ago. So, you never want to take a word and have a doctrine of. Doctrine of election. Doctrine of adoption. Doctrine of predestination. No, 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 no. And we're, I'm going to do a whole separate video on this. But words in Scripture, are, we think that... When the biblical writers were writing, that they had some kind of overarching doctrine in mind, and that there's some kind of unifying theory that ties together all the uses of that word. All the uses of the word justification tie into a singular, you know, semantically disambiguated doctrine of justification, where they, in, in the grand scheme of things, if you have the right overlay, then they don't contradict. That's, none of them were thinking that way when they wrote anything. And the Holy Spirit wasn't guiding them that way. What those people are doing is they're trying to make a point and they're using a word in service to that point. And you have to understand that point and don't get caught up on the appearance of the word for which 
you've been taught to have doctrines of. Doctrine of justification, doctrine of... Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. It just causes you to eisegete the text. Godliness is innate to every human soul and no, is in no way related to belief in Jesus, but rather is part and parcel of the original creation of all men. It's kind of interesting that you would say that because in Romans chapter 2, verse uh, 14, if you look at what men do by nature, you know, Calvinists say men have sin nature. The phrase sin nature is not a Bible phrase. But the Bible does say in Romans 2, 14, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law... By the way, would, if the gen, would he be able to say that if there was a Septuagint floating around at the time? Hmm. Something to think about. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. What do they do by nature? The things contained in the law. They're not out there being totally depraved. They're out there by nature. They are following the law by nature. That's what they're doing. That's what the text says. If you don't like it, I don't care. I really don't care. Uh, how is it your assurance? Have you considered that you are the one who actually doesn't understand it? That's my uh, issue right there. I don't think that uh, Calvinists understand Calvinism. They are so manipulated that when they were duped into Calvinism, they they were feeling this this moral overload of virtue and righteousness and morality for affirming these things. And when they hear it fed back to them the way I'm giving it to you, they don't feel it that way. It sounds, I'm, I'm giving it to you as nasty as it really is. And they want, they want you to feel this moralist, this, you know, moral upright virtue righteous feeling, which makes you less effective, w that they felt when they were duped into it. Well, that's not going to happen around here. Kevin is spot on. Thanks for the comment there. Um, the encouraging comment. It appears his assurance is on a good day when his pastor can't see him sinning. <laughs> Calvinism says God made people he doesn't care for to destroy his own delight. That's, that's pretty much what it says. The resurrection of Christ is my assurance according to the scripture as far as I see it. Yet yeah, that's right there in Acts chapter 17 verse 31. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men. There you go. That's plain and simple. But that could not be assurance for you if you were a Calvinist and you believed in limited atonement and weren't sure whether or not he died for you in the first place before he rose again. Uh, that's my conundrum. I don't understand how Calvinists can be saved if they can't be sure if they are elect, seeing as the Bible were saved by grace through faith. The thumbnail is funny. Thank you. I, uh, I actually did a class with my 9 and 12 year olds on how to make thumbnails when I made that thumbnail. <laughs> so, because they are trying to do some things on YouTube too. Or perhaps when he fails testing himself in the faith, there's no assurance because you can never prove that you're elect. Uh, people can be indwelled, saved, and yet be very confused and buffeted by the enemy. Uh, you might enjoy last Wednesday night's conversation when it comes to some of these comments here. Uh, there's a great resemblance between the elect of God and those impressed with fading faith. The reprobate believe God to be prop <laughs> prop propitious to the, and they accept the gift of reconciliation. I'm not sure what's being said there. Might be some, uh, might just be my brain not processing it well, or some fat fingering. All of us have the capacity for godliness and righteousness and the gifts of God. Okay, I think I already read that. Lots of Calvinists are saved, but that's okay. If Satan fails at preventing your belief, then he tried to prevent your spreading proper gospel. Uh, ask your pastor, where is the assurance of salvation? Interesting stuff. How could God judge righteously if he didn't offer salvation to all? It's a very good question. I'm not really searching for answers on some things. My pastor is responding to my reaching out. <laughs> that thumbnail is funny. Comfort one another with these words. It's quite probable God hates you, always hated you, and there's nothing you can do. Isn't that comforting? <laughs> now enjoy your common grace and feel the breeze on your skin and then go burn in oceans and rivers of liquid fire for all eternity. According to Colossians 2.8, be aware of man, of man philosophy. I don't believe that Calvinists are saved. <clears throat> Um, all right. It seems Calvinists think they believe the Bible because they assume that they have the right to spiritualize anything they want. Spiritualize. 
So he's making a pun there. Spiritual lies versus spiritual lies. Anything they want. I see this with most who swallow covenant theology. Uh, has none. The BOC, I'm not sure what that is. <clears throat> has none. Well, yeah, they... Um, they think that just because they use the Bible for their sophistry, that that means they believe it. No, you, because you're a professing Christian, you're having to use the Bible to fool the rest of Christians that you're also one of them. But you obviously don't believe what the text says. Calvinism almost seems reactionary to charismatics. Well, the charismatics that we see today came about 300 years after... <laughs> after the Re uh, Reformation. But today's Calvinism, maybe. Now, what Calvinists like to do here is a good point, case in point for this. And I'm a little over an hour here, so we're going to have to quit here in a minute. But <laughs> Calvinism, what they do is, instead of telling you epistemically why their belief is true, they point out all these other things, like Bethel and Hillsong, and, you know, the Bethel Movement and Joel Osteen and uh, Pat Robertson and what are some of these other guys and Sima Pelagianism and Arminianism. They point out all these wrong things and give you the impression, they're good at manipulating you and giving you the impression that the only way to avoid being any one of those things is by being a Calvinist. And if you don't affirm Calvinism, then they will find a way to map you to one of those evil things. And that's one of the manipulation tactics that they use. So in a way, you could say, it, it, depending on the context and how they're presenting things, if you watch that Netflix series, The American Gospel, they tell you all these wrong things, but they don't tell you what's right with Calvinistic distinctives. They just make you think that these Calvinistic preachers are the only place you can find truth. And if you don't go to them, you're going to wind up in, in all, you know, mixed up in all this other kind of error. It's a manipulation tactic is what it is. Pointing away from other things rather than pointing you to some truth. A lot of comments here. Uh, uh, Brother James at SOC says, Brother Kevin, really appreciate all you do. Thanks for the super chat, Brother James. Really appreciate that. Um, a lot of other comments here. I don't have time to get to them all. Great work, Kevin. Keep it up. Appreciate that. Shredheads, good to see you here. See a few names that I that I recognize. And uh, yeah, Sigam Kataro. I, I know you, but I don't even know how to say your name. Maybe you could tell me how to pronounce it. Because I know we talk a lot on Facebook, things like that. All right. Uh, yeah. Shredhead, have you ever checked out the Waitster? Yeah, the Waitster's been on here before, and he's got some good stuff on Calvinism too. Okay, BOC, Body of Christ, got that. All right, so we're going to wrap this up for today. We're done. And the last thing on the slide, basically the takeaway from today, is that the grace that is found in Scripture is not found anywhere in Calvinism, and the grace that is touted in Calvinism is not found anywhere in Scripture. And we demonstrated that in this video. Uh, thanks for watching. May the Lord bless you and good day.